Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome this beautiful, beautiful autumn morning. The day the Lord has made, we are rejoicing and glad to be here, and it's good to see all of you. Let us begin by preparing our hearts for worship, sort of quieting our hearts, our minds. Brenda's going to play some music on the organ to allow us to do that. So let us prepare our hearts for worship. Psalm 37 is our call to worship this morning. If you are able, would you please stand and join me in reading these verses responsibly. Do not be angry because of the wicked. Do not be envious of wrongdoers. For they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so you will dwell in the land and enjoy security. Take the light in the Lord who will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in God, who will act, bringing forth your vindication as the light and your right as the noonday. Be still and wait patiently before the Lord. Do not be angry because of those who prosper in their way, because of those who carry out evil devices. Refrain from anger. Forsake wrath. Do not be angry. It will only lead to evil. For the wicked shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall possess the land. Yet a little while and the wicked will be no more. Though you look at their place, they will not be there. But the meek shall possess the land and delight in abundant prosperity. Or be gathered to worship you, the true and just living God. Lord, meet us here. Fill this place, fill each heart with your Holy Spirit as we worship you this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Remain standing for our opening hymn.
you pray with me the unison prayer? Let us pray together. Divine Judge, you formed the earth with love and mercy and declared it good. Yet we, desiring to justify ourselves, judge others harshly without knowledge or understanding. Keep us faithful that we may be filled with the knowledge of your will and not ignore the needs of others, but in your love show mercy. Amen. seated again a special welcome to all of you this morning especially those of you who are joining us online via our live stream welcome one and all especially any guests we have with us there's a guest information card it's yellow it's in front of you in that card holder if you're with us as a guest we'd love a way of keeping in contact with you so if you wouldn't mind filling one of those out make sure we get it back hand it to me after the service I'd love to meet you you can just set it on the table as you leave but uh, welcome to one and all I want to point out just a couple things in your bulletin in the way of announcement. Last evening, I'd say about 100 or 200, close to 200 of us gathered for our family fall fest down in the fellowship hall. Had a great time, fun, food, fellowship for all, and uh, we all went home and watched the Guardians win. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, thanks to everybody, Doug, Meek, and his team that helped pull off our family fall fest. It was a huge success. Pumpkin patch fundraiser and bake sale was going on last night. I think there's still some items left over. If you're interested, there's pumpkins and mums and some baked goods down in our fellowship hall, but uh, that fundraiser goes to support our uh, children's ministry. So thank you for your support. Uh, let's see, our community Thanksgiving dinner. We've not had that for a couple years because of COVID. We've helped and, and given to some other similar uh, dinners, Thanksgiving events in the community, but for the first time in two years, we're having our community Thanksgiving dinner. So if you're new to Wadsworth, the United Methodist Church, it's one of the big deals around here. It takes a ton of people to help. Tom Redding is coordinating it again this year. Tom told me if you see him coming, don't run, stop, turn around and say, sign me up, Tom. The more we have to help, the better it is. There's a sign-up sheet back on a table by the elevator, tucked back in the corner. Uh, for other ways that you can sign up to help. So uh, please sign up to help with our community Thanksgiving dinner. We're happy to, to have that this year. We're continuing to collect uh, personal hygiene items for men, women, and children. We're distributing those through uh, Marion's Closet. There's a table back by the uh, Good Shepherd stained glass window in the far lobby uh, where you can drop those off or any donations. Um, the last Sunday of the month, the 30th, is our Women's Sunday. So we're putting together a women's chorus that we'll be singing that, that morning. So if you're interested in being in our women's chorus, um, Brenda can help you out. She's putting that together. So other things are going on. Uh, please be sure to look through your bulletin in its entirety. But before we turn to our prayer time this morning, we're going to sing one more hymn. And you may remain seated as we sing, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us. Oh, I'm sorry. I jumped the gun. Diane's going to come and read our scripture lessons. You want to hear those, right? Yeah, I was just all anxious to pray and sing, and, but uh, Diane's going to come and share our scripture lessons. She's looking at me like, what about me? <laughs> Got to have the scriptures, right? The Old Testament scripture this morning is from the book of Genesis, chapter 50, verses 15 through 21. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, 
your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept fell down before him and said, we are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for all good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. The New Testament scripture this morning is from the book of Romans, chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, you have no excuse, whoever you are, when you judge others. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, are doing the very same things. You say, we know that God's judgment on those who do such things is in accordance with truth. Do you imagine, whoever you are, that when you judge those who do such things and yet do them yourself, you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience? Do you not realize that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? The word of God for the people of God.
Friends, I invite you to take from your bulletin the weekly prayer concerns and uh, just have that before you as we pray. And I encourage you to keep it near you throughout your week and lift these folks in prayers. Just want to highlight a couple names Susan Kohler Shogun, that's Bill Kohler's daughter. She passed away uh, this past week down in Virginia. So we add the name of Susan Kohler Shogun. Shirley Oxter is uh, Pam Douglas's mother. So we continue prayers for the family of Shirley Oxter. So let me just remind you, if you are responsible for one of these prayer concerns, please let us know any updates, any answered prayer. We like to keep this prayer list as current as we can so our prayers can be as uh, effective as they possibly can. So let's take a moment in silence and invite you to just look over this list. I realize some of these names you won't know, but God knows. I'll lead us in a time of prayer and invite you to join me in the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Blessed Jesus, hear, oh, hear us when we pray. Lord, we thank you that you lead us like a gentle and tender shepherd, not as a harsh task master, but a kind and gentle shepherd. No, oh, Lord, we need your leading. We need your tender care. We need your grace and your spirit to just overwhelm us, fill us. Lord, oftentimes the, the path is rough, Often it's an uphill climb. But thank you, Lord, through your spirit, you walk with us. Often you carry us. And you give us strength, you give us hope, you give us courage. And often you send others alongside of us. And we thank you for all the many ways, Lord. You're with us and in us and for us. And thank you, Lord, that there's nothing, absolutely nothing, in life or in death that can separate us from your great love in Jesus Christ. Lord, some of these names have been on this list for too long. But make us persistent in prayer, faithful in prayer. Lord, we ask that you touch each life. each home, each family. Give hope and strength and peace, comfort, healing as only you can. So gentle shepherd, lead us. And help us to follow. And we pray this all in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray the, together the prayer he taught his disciples, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. If you came prepared to give this morning, we're not passing over offering plates. There's an offering box located on the table as you enter the sanctuary. Uh, you can drop your offerings in there. But we can still praise God and sing the doxology. So would you please stand and join me as we do so?
be. Apart from you, Lord, we are absolutely nothing. So help us always to give thanks. Help us always to be generous for all that you have done for us. That the blessings that you have given us may be used to bless others. Lord, bless each gift and bless each giver. For we give and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.
Thank you, choir. That was another beautiful, beautiful anthem. AmeriQuest Mortgage Company. I don't know much about them. I don't even know if they're still in business. The only thing I know about AmeriQuest Mortgage Company is several years ago, they ran some ads uh, on the TV uh, that were very creative. I thought kind of humorous. I think some of them even aired during the Super Bowl, which uh, some of you may know is kind of known for its uh, creative and humorous um, TV commercials. But the punchline for this series of AmeriQuest Mortgage Company ads was simply, do not judge too quickly, we won't. I guess when you're applying for a mortgage, they won't judge you too quickly. So in one of such, of the such commercials, there was a man, and he's carrying home a bag of groceries, and he has a bouquet of flowers, obviously wants to do something special for his wife. So he goes in, uh, begins preparing some spaghetti sauce, sets the table, arranges the flowers. Uh, take a look what happens next. Don't judge too quickly. AmeriQuest yeah. Mortgage, proud sponsor of the NFL. <laughs> and another one, there's a guy talking on a cell phone. He's got an earpiece into one of his friends, and he's walking into, the, the guy on the cell phone's walking into a mom-pop kind of convenience store. Obviously, he's talking to a friend who wants to build a new deck on his house, and he must be getting quotes or bids uh, on a new deck. So he walks in the store, grabs something out of the cooler, takes it to the counter, see what happens next. Hello. How much are they asking? Well, that's a lot of money for a deck. Well, I hate to tell you this, but you're getting robbed. Uh, did you hear me? You're getting robbed. AmeriQuest, an open-minded, equal opportunity lender. Don't judge too quickly. In the next one, there's a couple of doctors and they're standing over a patient. They're looking at his chart. He's laying in a hospital bed, obviously getting ready to discharge him. Uh, take a look. This has a fractured fibula. Give him a mild center so he can be able to go home tomorrow. Daddy's going to be so excited. That killed him. And this last one, there's a guy sitting on a park bench eating his lunch. He's got his dog, and he finishes off his lunch uh, with a chocolate brownie. Take a look. Look at the cute dog. Don't judge too quickly. <laughs> you know, these, they're humorous, obviously, very creative. But I think what also makes them, you know, popular is the fact that I think they strike a chord with everyone who's ever been judged, you know, too quickly or, or unfairly. The interesting thing about these commercials is that the people, you know, they didn't make their, you know, premature judgments based on hearsay or, or rumor. They actually saw it with their own eyes. The guy saw, you know, the wife saw the guy with the cat and the knife with his, her own eyes. The, you know, the store owner heard it with his own ears. But even though they heard it firsthand, it wasn't through rumor and hearsay, they still jumped to the wrong conclusions. They still made the wrong interpretations. It never occurred to them that they were judging too quickly. Here's how Jesus put it. Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's or sister's eye and pay no attention to the plank, right, the board, the log, in your own eye? How can you say to a brother or sister, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. 
First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother or your sister's eye. Boy, there is so much in this passage of Scripture this morning from the Sermon on the Mount that we could talk about. But let me just say at the outset, you know, friends, Jesus is not even beginning to suggest that his followers should not be magistrates or, or you know, officers of, of the law court. You know, God wants and intends his world to be ordered and to be just. What Jesus is referring to is not law courts, that kind of judging, but to judgments and condemnations that happen in everyday ordinary life. People set themselves up as, you know, moral guardians or critics to others. Now, Jesus has a specific target in mind. He's thinking of the scribes and the Pharisees, those hyper-religious leaders of his day who, who tried to create this moral climate in which everybody looked at everybody else and policed everyone else to try to make sure that everybody was living up to the standards that the Pharisees had set. Often, even today, the, the moralism, it's just as fierce. The target's probably changed. Today, for instance, it might be the environment. Maybe somebody with a different point of view, a political candidate, a particular point of view from a po political point of standpoint. And, you know, in some neighborhoods, in some neighborhoods, neighbors spy on each other to make sure they place the right kind of garbage in the right container and maintain the appearance of their yard or their landscaping. Some of you know Susan and I have a condo down in Galleon where she works, and sometimes we commute back and forth. In our condo association, we have a group of neighbors. They're well-intended, but they feel it's their responsibility to let anyone in the association know that their landscaping or their flower beds aren't quite up to the standards which they feel they should be, and they're not bashful about letting you know. <laughs> Let me just say, Jesus is not suggesting, friends, that we should not have standards of behavior. But he's addressing the temptation that we all have to look down on others for their moral failures and the temptation for all of us to play God. Since none of us are God, at least last time I checked, it means it's a temptation to play a part, to act a role. As I said, that's what that word hypocrite means, to literally to put on a mask or a disguise. Jesus is warning us to keep from making mistakes when it comes to, to judging others. And I think the first thing that he wants us to know, friends, is simply do not condemn others. Don't condemn others. Man, especially today in this, this environment, it's so easy to demonize people who we disagree with or whose lifestyles or points of view don't match up with our own personal standards. It's so easy to think that, that someone can never change or will never change, that they're beyond hope. Friends, with Jesus, no one was ever beyond hope. If a person was sick, Jesus believed they could be healed. If someone was dead, Jesus believed that they could live again. If someone sinned, Jesus believed that they could be forgiven. In fact, in Luke's gospel, he said this, Be merciful just as your Father. Your Father in heaven is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. He's talking about this element of condemnation that makes judging others so egregious. And people who condemn are those who condemn not only the act, but the actor, the person. They focus on the faults of others and fail to see their own. And the warning, of course, is that if we judge others, we too will be judged. Those who are always critical and demanding of other people It doesn't go unnoticed. Those who show mercy will be shown mercy. Those who judge harshly will be harshly judged. Those who are always picking at others will have their own faults and errors picked at. Those who exude mercy, by the same measure, will receive Mercy, that's what Jesus said. With the measure you use, it will be used to you. Humility, my friends, is the key. 
Humility is what is needed and required in our walk with God and our relationships with others. But of course, one of the big problems in our evaluation of other people is that we see their faults and we're blind to our own. It's like the man who drove by the same farm day after day, admired this certain horse that would graze out in the pasture. He loved the horse. Finally, he went up to the farmhouse and he told the farmer, I've been admiring your horse for a long time. I want to buy it. I'll pay you top dollar. And the old farmer just said, I don't know. That horse, he don't look too good. The man insisted, he's fine. He looks healthy. He looks strong. I'll pay you $100 more than he's worth. The old farmer again said, I don't know. He don't look too good. And finally, the man persuaded the farmer to sell the horse, took him home, threw a saddle on him, jumped on him, kicked him in the sides. The horse immediately took off running, ran into a huge oak tree, fell over, and he died. The man was furious. Went back to the farmer and said, you sold me a blind horse. The farmer shrugged and said, I told you, he don't look too good. And that's what Jesus is trying to warn of. Don't be blind to your own faults. I hope you see the humor and the hyperbole of Jesus. He wants you to picture somebody, picture in your mind somebody who's worrying about a speck of sawdust in your eye while all the while walking around with a log or a plank or a beam sticking out of their eye. That's how ridiculous Jesus says it is. But isn't that the way it is? Those who are most critical seem to be the ones with the most glaring faults. They drive you crazy with their compulsive criticism and guilting, but they never do anything wrong. They use a magnifying glass to look at your faults, but they put blinders on when it comes to their own. They ridicule, they mock. Their remarks are always judgmental. They're always tearing people down. And those were the hyper-religious people of Jesus' day who fiercely criticized Jesus for healing on a holy day, on the Sabbath day, while all the while plotting to murder Jesus on a Sabbath. Now, if that's not a sawdust speck versus a log, I don't know. And that's why Jesus warns us about being judgmental, because... We can all be blind to our own faults. Paul writes, you then, why do you judge your brother or your sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we all will stand before God's judgment seat. And so then each of us will give account for ourselves to God. I think Paul's point is, friends, don't worry about it. Let God be God. Let God be the judge. And realize that no one is ultimately going to get away with anything. We all will stand before the one true and righteous judge of heaven and earth and give account. Paul said it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due for us for the things while done while, done and while in the body, whether good or bad. God is the judge. Let him be. The second thing I think Jesus wants us to see from this teaching is that we shouldn't rush to judgment. Now I'm guessing if you live long enough, all of us, all of us are going to have my cat got into the spaghetti sauce moment. At some point, somebody's going to see us do something or hear us say something, misinterpret it, however embarrassing it might be. One of the first nights I was living in the parsonage here about 11 and a half years ago, as you know, Susan commutes, she was away. I was alone, just me and the dog. It was probably midnight. Like I said, it was like one of the first or second nights I was in the parsonage. It was about midnight. The dog had to go outside. And so I took the dog out about midnight. All I had on was a pair of gym shorts, no shirt, no socks, no shoes. And I locked myself out of the parsonage. I did. It was like midnight. Now, you think I'm going to go knocking on my new, new neighbor's door like at midnight wearing nothing but a pair of gym shorts and say, Hi, I'm your new neighbor. No. <laughs> what would they have thought? I guess my point is, friends, maybe the best thing we can do is just give people the benefit 
of the doubt. Extend some grace. Too often we jump to the conclusion, and it's often the wrong conclusion. Jesus said, stop judging by mere appearances. Instead, judge correctly. Take into consideration, friends, that you do not have all the information. You do not have all the facts. Understand that there are people who will want you to side with them so badly that they will try to convince you of things that may not necessarily be true or accurate. It happens. There are those who assume the worst without even giving a hint of getting to the truth of the facts. Give people the benefit of the doubt. The other day I made a remark about someone to Susan, and I said, well, what do you think? And she simply said, it's not my, my place to judge. Good advice. Because we seem so predisposed to look unfavorably on the characteristics and actions of others, and it leads to us pronouncing rash, unjust, unloving judgments. One of the things that's so bad about judging in that way is you don't know people's motives. You don't know people's hearts. You don't know their story. You don't know what they're thinking. And so we jump to false conclusions much of the time. The Sioux Indians have a prayer that says, Oh, great spirit, let me not judge another until I have worn his moccasins for a moon or two. And the third thing I think Jesus wants us to take from this is use discernment. Use discernment. And this is so important. It's why I saved it for last. We are to be generous in our mercy and reserve in our judgment as much as possible. We are to overlook each other's faults and imperfections and failings. We love each other in spite of misunderstandings mis, uh, or disappointments and disagreements. Don't allow yourself to get into the habit of being critical. Develop a heart that is generous in your opinion of others. Give people space. Don't expect perfection, especially, especially in the church of Jesus Christ where we disagree. In Paul's day, there was a, a disagreement amongst Christians that whether it was right or not to eat meat that was sacrificed to idols. Some Christians were still sacrificing meat to idols and was it, you know, some thought, oh, it was just awful. Others thought they're false gods, they don't, you know, they're not real. It doesn't matter. And the same kind of thing happens today. We're not supposed to judge other Christians who, in good conscience, uh, see some things differently when, than we do. Some believe certain things are wrong. Others say not, see nothing wrong with them. But friends, having said that, that does not mean that we do not excuse any kind of behavior without discernment. The key is discernment. There is a moral standard. There are some things that are obviously wrong. The scripture is clear that certain things are immoral. To ignore these things is foolishness. It's interesting in that passage from Romans that Diane read, Romans chapter 2, verse 1. Paul says, you therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. What's interesting about this verse at the beginning of chapter 2 is Paul spends most of chapter 1 condemning sins of idolatry, sexual impurity, perversion, greed, depravity. He talks about people who are gossip, slanderers, God-haters, arrogant, boastful, evildoers, disobedient, faithless, heartless, ruthless. And then he gives this admonition not to judge. Paul's obviously got something different in mind than, than having an opinion or never having an opinion about right or wrong. God doesn't want us to turn our brains off 
friends and be completely unthinking or turn a blind eye in our approach to people or their behavior, but discern. Jesus said this in that passage in John or Matthew chapter 7, do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to the pigs. If you do, they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. We don't offer communion to dogs. I love dogs, but come on. They don't understand the sacredness. You don't give your jewelry to pigs, right? I think what Jesus wants us to realize, friends, that there are some people who are like that. They don't understand the sacred. They have no respect for the things of God because they don't know the things of God. Speaking the truth to some, even in love, might get you punched in the face. If you talk to some about their morals, they might tear you to pieces. That's what Jesus is saying. And others will treat your Christian experience, your experience of Christ, with contempt. And they'll trample it in the mud. There are some people who are blind to spiritual things and to the grace of God. And to recognize that is not to be critical or judgmental, it's to discern, to use your minds. When Jesus says, do not judge, it's not a blanket statement against any kind of critical thinking. It's a call to be discerning. It's a warning against the kind of hypercritical judgment that tears others down to lift yourself up. At the church of Corinth, there was a man who was committing an egregious, immoral sin. It was wrong, it was evil, and Paul wanted the church to know it. And he wrote the church, concerned for the man and the church, he says, what business is it of mine to judge those outside? Are you not to judge those inside, Paul said? Let God judge those outside. Expel the wicked man from among you. It sounds harsh, friends, but that's what it means to discern that kind of immoral behavior. Last Sunday afternoon, I went to the Browns game. If some of you wondered where I disappeared to after the service, Susan's boss invited me to the Browns game. I hadn't been to a Browns game in years. I'd never gone to one on a Sunday afternoon since I've lived in Northeast Ohio. But I went to the Browns game last last Sunday afternoon. It's not the first time I've been in an NFL football stadium. I knew what I was in for. I knew how people were going to yell and talk and act and behave. I knew what I was going to And I wasn't shocked by any of it. I have been there before. Did I like it? Of course not. Would I take my grandson? No. Right? But I knew what to expect. And if I'd have turned around and told the gentleman behind me who was screaming all kinds of obscenities and, sir, would you please refrain from talking? He probably would have punched me in the mouth or poured his beer on me, right? But if I'd have turned around and it would have been one of you, I might have been disappointed. (laughs) Yeah, I would have probably said something. See, friends, we know what to expect from the world, don't we? We know. But we don't have to expect that here. Why? Because supposedly... We've been touched by the Spirit of God. We have experienced the grace of God. So we have a right to judge. And some will cry, well, that's foul. Who are you to judge? But tell me, friends, what kind of people would we be as the church if we allowed a child or a spouse to to continue to be abused And we just turned a blind eye and said, who am I to judge? Is that love? Or what kind of people would we be if someone who we knew in our congregation was being unfaithful to his or her spouse and we just threw up our hands and said, I'm not to judge. 
Now, what kind of church would we be or community would we be if we allowed our leaders in the church or in our schools or in our local governments to, to, to be living in obviously immoral behavior and ignore it? Or what kind of parents would we be if we knew our children or someone we loved was involved in harmful, illegal behavior and we overlooked it? See, friends, it's important that we confront each other in love, but when we do, our goal is always restoration and reconciliation smothered with grace and mercy. And our goal is to restore relationships with God and others, not to cast judgment. Jesus said, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. It's a delicate balance, my friends, sometimes a difficult balance between good judgment and being judgmental. We all fall in the judgmental realm at at times. That's why we have to stay close to Christ. That's why we have to constantly inspect our own lives. That's why we constantly have to be in prayer. Now, I know you'd be disappointed if I didn't quote from C.S. Lewis this morning, so I'm going to. In Mere Christianity, Lewis says this, If anyone thinks that Christians regard Unchastity, he's talking about sexual sin, sexual immorality. If anyone thinks that Christians regard sexual sin as the supreme vice, right, the chief sin, that person is quite wrong. The sins of the flesh are bad, but they are the least bad of all sins, Lewis says. All the worst pleasures are purely spiritual, they're not of the flesh. The pleasure of putting other people in, to the, in the wrong, of bossing, of backbiting, the pleasures of power, of hatred, on and on. And he talks about this. He says, there are two things living inside of me. They are the animal self and the diabolical self. And the diabolical self is the worst of the two. And here's the clincher. That is why a cold, self-righteous prude who goes regularly to church may be far nearer to hell than a prostitute. But of course, he concludes, it's better to be neither. Jesus said, be merciful as your Father in heaven is merciful. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. God, help us by your power and your grace to remove the log, the plank, from our own eye. Lord, not so in order that we can see better the speck in the other's eye, but so we may know and experience the power of your grace and your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now our closing hymn this morning, friends, may not be real familiar to some of you, so choir, you've got to help us out. But if you don't know the tune... I think the words are just so, so appropriate. So if you would, if you're able, would you please stand as we sing together?
Friends, go in that light, that mercy, that grace, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace.